is our second webinar of 2019, and we are beginning the year with a two-part series focused on Mexico uh, and uh, Outlook 2019. The first in that series was last week with a focus on oil issues in Mexico, and particularly uh, some of the issues dealing with the fuel crisis that started the year, Pemex Finance, and uh, a host of other topics. We hope you were able to join us for that. If not, the recording is available. Today, we are going to switch gears a bit to the natural gas outlook for 2019, but particularly, we're going to uh, leverage a, a, a great bit of research that our colleague here at UC San Diego, uh, John McNeese, who's a, cent a fellow at the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies. Uh, most of you, hopefully, were able to see the papers John wrote last year. He spent, uh, it seems like, most of 2018 writing an analysis of U.S.-Mexico natural gas trade, um, and, and he has a lot of information to share on that, and particularly uh, some of the elements regarding the risks involved and how to mitigate those risks and how to ameliorate those risks when it comes to the amazing dependency or the incredible growth in, in trade between Mexico and the United States in natural gas. I use the word dependency because I think that's sometimes what uh, folks in Mexico look at as a, a growing dependency on uh, available cheaper natural gas supplies, uh, largely by pipeline, but also some LNG from the U.S., um, which of course is largely on the back of the shale revolution in the U.S., which has led to such an excess capacity in our natural gas market and the economic upside in terms of price. We're also pleased to have with us, uh, direct from Mexico City, Veronica Iradastorza, and I'm sure many of you joining us today remember Veronica and know her, both in terms of her current role as a consultant at Near Economic Consulting, but also for her time uh, in the government in Sener as the Deputy Minister, Deputy Secretary for Planning and Energy Transition. Uh, and Veronica in that job was largely responsible for the, uh, the outlook documents that Sener would produce with regularity on both natural gas, but a whole host of other uh, energy topics and energy segments in Mexico. So we have two uh, experts today with us. I don't want to spend too much time because I want to let them get right to it. There's a lot of information, and as you can imagine, it's it's uh, it's always more than one hour allows us. But we will begin with a formal presentation, and just as a way of introduction for anyone who hasn't joined us, we utilize the chat function for the question and answer session. And so what you, uh, and I see Alejandra, when has already availed herself of the chat function. Thank you, Alejandra. But just pose your question via the chat function, via, via that bar that's at the uh, lower part of your screen. And uh, we, you don't have to wait, by the way, until the end of the presentation. Feel free, if there's something that comes up during the course of the formal presentation, feel free to, to jump in, weigh in, make a comment, ask a question. And then John and Veronica uh, will come back and we'll, we'll wrap up with hopefully about 15 minutes at the end and address any of those questions, comments, or concerns that you brought up during the course of the formal presentation. So, like I said, there is an enormous amount of, uh, of material to cover here. Uh, natural gas is a, is a hugely important topic for Mexico. Um, there's been a little bit of debate in the last few weeks over whether fracking and whether unconventional resources will be developed. Uh, perhaps that's something we can discuss later in the podcast. But like I said, um, John McNeese will uh, begin the formal presentation with uh, a synthesized version of his research and al analysis on U.S.-Mexico natural gas trade, uh, where we are, where we where we come from, uh, where we're going, and, and again, how how to look at this from a risk profile uh, both ways in terms of Mexico and U.S. So, without any further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to John McNeese, who I think is dialing in from just downstairs here at the Center for U.S.-Mexico Studies at UCSD. John. Jeremy, thanks so much, and thanks to the Institute of the Americas for presenting this webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you all today, and thanks for attending. And thanks also to Veronica Aristorza from NERA, who is a, a real pro in this area and who's going to be giving her, uh, her comments towards the end and also speak to the, um, uh, the current economic uh, political situation. So starting with an overview, just to tell you where we're going to go, we're going to talk first about Mexico's natural gas production, consumption, and imports, uh, historical figures, projections, and then the CNH proposals uh, are very interesting. This was a major book that um, CNH put in place before uh, AMLO came to office, and Veronica is going to speak to that. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the projected imports um, and the capacity, that is the infrastructure to handle that, which is, which is an interesting topic because there's a lot more capacity than deliveries. Um, I want to talk about the fact that uh, with so much imports we talk about, there is a risk uh, factor that Mexico has to consider and we will assess the risks. Um, strategies going forward, talking about production, need for storage, need for clean energy. And then um, towards the end, uh, the last section, Veronica is going to comment on the topics we've covered before, and then uh, she will speak to the, um, the political situation, what President Lopez Obrador proposes to do, um, strengthening next the issues of demand, uncertainty on clean energy, and then this major issue of fracking. So jumping right into the um, the figures, this, these historical figures from Sener came from a, um, a document that Sener presented in March of 2018. They were analyzing storage needs for Mexico, but um, uh, did an overview of the situation with uh, production, consumption, and imports. And you'll see here that um, uh, consumption has been moving up uh, very rapidly toward with a shift towards use of natural gas for electrical energy, uh, production has been declining. And this is, uh, this is dry natural gas. Um, so it has declined and then importation was making up the difference. So you see in 2017, you had consumption of um, 8 billion cubic feet a day, um, production of 3,000 and imports of 5,000. So when I ran the numbers on this, you had 59% of the uh, consumption in Mexico for 2017 uh, coming from US imports. And this is a bit of a complicated side next. These are projections from the Ministry of Energy, Sener, and the Energy Information Administration in the United States, which is a, a part of the Department of Energy in the US. Um, the red line, once again, is Sener demand. Um, the blue line at the bottom is Sener production. And they, as you see, they project uh, production going up. The solid green line towards the bottom is Sener's projections of imports, so it's declining pretty significantly. And then the dotted green line is the, um, the EIA number on exports, pipeline exports, which is actually less than total exports because it doesn't include um, uh, LNG. So the, the key message here is that uh, you have um, the EIA uh, export projections way ahead of the corresponding Sener import projections. And this is shown in more detail in this slide. Um, now, the Sener projections under the um, Prospectiva de Gas Natural 2018 through 2032, the green line at the bottom, and it shows imports dropping significantly, whereas the EIA projections on gas exports via pipeline going up very considerably. OK, let me get this right here. Hold on one second. On these projected imports, comparing the Sener numbers versus the EIA, uh, under Sener, imports peak at 5.57 billion cubic feet a day with a hypothetical cost of $6.6 .6 billion. And that's a 2017 price of $3.26 per thousand cubic feet. And that's the number that was actually in place for uh, pipeline deliveries in 2017, according to the EIA numbers. So it declines considerably. 
the EIA, EIA export figures go up over time up to 8.38 billion cubic feet in 2050, hypothetical cost of $10 billion. And I want to highlight here that the um, EIA report, which is the annual energy outlook 2018, which is one year ago, had a peak of 7.1 billion cubic feet in 2029, going down to 6 billion cubic feet in 2050. Um, I want to highlight simply that the EIA figures are much higher than the corresponding scenario figures. Possible reasons, we can only speculate, but production will not be as high as scenario projects, according to the EIA projections, or clean energy won't come online as quickly. Um, Veronica, you want to speak to the um, uh, CNH proposals? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, this is a chart that summarizes the, the scenarios that CNH did, as John said before, the López Obrador term. And uh, they have these three scenarios. And if you look at the base case for that, they just use the trends that were from the previous nine years and the decrease in gas production for the forecast is 2.97%, which is pretty <laughs> drastic. And then if you go to the other extreme is the disruptive case, and they just assume a 14% average annual growth rate for natural gas production. So of course that has a huge effect on imports. And uh, John will talk about this a little bit more later, but um, I wanna show you here the imports from each of these scenarios. And as you can see on the first, on the base case scenarios, the imports would increase drastically while on the disruptive case, they come almost to zero by 2030. Okay, um, talking about cross-border pipeline capacity, and this becomes very important because we've just talked about how much imports could go up. Um, the key point, capacity is far beyond projected deliveries. Uh, as of 2016, Mexico already had cross-border pipeline crossings with the past capacity of 7.5 billion cubic feet a day. And according to um, uh, Mexico's own projections, and this is from Senegas, uh, it would increase to 13.5 billion cubic feet a day by 2019. Now remember, we've got imports right now of only about 5 billion cubic feet a day. So this is uh, considerably higher than current deliveries. And comparing this with the US numbers, there is a existing and authorized pipeline capacity of 15 billion cubic feet a day. So almost three um, times now, this is existing and authorized. And Veronica later is gonna to speak to what's actually happening. Happening. So why is the capacity so much bigger than projected imports? We're not sure, but developers think it's needed and they are putting their money uh, on the line to support that. If indeed there are greater imports needed, the infrastructure will be in place. So um, right now, as I mentioned earlier, 59% of all natural gas consumed in Mexico in 2017 came from imported US natural gas. And if these trends continue with the decline in production, uh, the CNA projects that in 2030, 94% of all natural gas consumed in Mexico will come from imports. Um, that's a huge number. So talking about the risks that Mexico is assuming with such reliance or dependence, if you will, on natural gas, uh, I'm gonna talk about availability risk, pricing risk, and what I call dependency political risk. Assessing availability risk, the question is, will it be available to export to Mexico while satisfying U.S. domestic needs and projected exports? The only way we can know how to deal with this is through forecasts and probability analysis. And the U.S. has put that analysis in place. Uh, 
we're looking here at two different documents, which is um, the EIA's annual energy outlook, which they do every year, and it has projections. And then uh, NERA, which is Veronica's firm, also did a major report entitled Macroeconomic Outcomes of Market Determined Levels of U.S. LNG Exports. And the point being to evaluate what are the consequences for U.S. pricing if exports do go up. Uh, availability risk. Um, these are charts from the annual Energy Outlook 2019. Um, they deal with different probability cases. Uh, a reference case, which is uh, which is the line in black, and then you've got this reference case here, and then you've got different um, probability cases beyond that, dealing with uh, higher low technology and gas resources, uh, higher low pricing. Um, and, and, and then a general uh, higher low economic growth. So in all of these scenarios, uh, production will be higher than uh, consumption. So there is gas available for uh, exports. On this availability risk dealing with competing LNG exports, I just want to highlight a figure here. The Department of Energy has received applications for natural gas exports in the form of LNG exceeding 50 billion cubic feet a day. I mean, that's that's huge. Um, we're talking about 5 billion cubic feet a day exports now to Mexico and projected high of 8 billion cubic feet so that the possible exports to uh, through LNG would dwarf exports to Mexico. Now, these are just applications. <clears throat> There's no assurance whatsoever that those uh, LNG compression and export facilities, the trains, will actually be built. But this is what the developers are saying they would like to build. So the NERA study um, finds that where increased exports are the result of increased market demand, 80% of the increase in LNG exports is satisfied by increased production of U.S. natural gas. This is very significant. Exports are not a zero-sum game where supplies are fixed and demand side must fight over shares. Instead, supply will grow in response to demand, including demand for exports. That's not 100% but 80% of the increase in exports would be satisfied by increased production. Assessing price risk, um, what price might Mexico have to pay? It's one thing for the gas to be available, but if you have to pay um, excessive amounts, then it becomes impossible. High prices would divert resources from other needs in Mexico and affect Mexico's energy balance of trade. Uh, we know that um, AMLO is very concerned about the energy balance of trade. When you consider the cost of imported gasoline and the cost of imported natural gas, uh, that is already <clears throat> higher on a dollar basis than the revenues that Mexico gets from the exports of petroleum. Okay, so the... Um, Annual Energy look Outlook 2019 for forecasts a moderate price rise or stable prices through 2015, except in the low oil and gas resource case, which is of low probability. And the NERA study shows that these price trends hold even where there are high LNG exports. And the critical determinant is the availability of supply, which in turn is predicated on technology supporting further development. So. According to the NERA study, um, if supply continues um, at the levels it has been with the uh, trend upward that we've seen, prices would be more or less steady with some uh, modest increase. And see, political risk is another issue that I, I want to focus on, and this is a big deal, potentially. Uh, 
if Mexico is dependent on U.S. natural gas, could the U.S. cut off or cut back deliveries or threaten that in order to pressure the Mexican government to accept U.S. political objectives? Um, and we've seen this before. The U.S. Um, um, is, is not, this is not something we've seen much of in the U.S., but if you look at the Russian cutoff of Ukraine, natu uh, Ukraine natural gas, this was highly controversial. Um, Russia said it was a commercial dispute on pricing and whether you can't, Ukraine is paying its bills. Uh, you see a quote from the Ukraine prime minister, this is not about gas, this is a general plan for the destruction of Ukraine. And President Trump, who likes to apply pressure, likes to view himself as a hard-nosed negotiator, um, has indicated that dependency on energy is um, a leverage point. He has said, Germany, as far as I'm concerned, is captive to Russia because it's getting so much of its energy from Russia. So let's look at this issue in terms of Mexico. First, U.S. natural gas producers are in the private sector and are politically well-connected. Uh, they would fight strenuously against a reduction of exports to Mexico. They're earning about $6.4 billion per year, and that's likely to go higher. So they would fight this uh, strongly. Um, all natural ga gas exporters, including LNG exporters, would fight back because they would see this as government interference in the market. And Congress could also fight back. Um, if you look at the NERA study, they found that uh, U.S. economic output is higher whenever global markets call for higher levels of LNG exports, assuming that exports are allowed to be determined by market demand. So exporting hydrocarbons is good for the U.S. economy, uh, so for President Trump to cut this off, to pressure Mexico is highly unlikely. The political environment would be, uh, um, uh, would present a very hard pushback. Uh, there are legal constraints. Uh, tariffs on exports are prohibited by the U.S. Constitution. Not many people know that, but it's there. You cannot put exports... Uh, tariffs in place because it's prohibited by the U.S. Constitution. U.S. law does provide for export permits on exports of natural gas, and the test is whether the export is in the public interest. Now, uh, there's a statutory framework which says that exports to public, uh, to countries that are uh, part of a free trade agreement with the U.S. where there's national treatment of natural gas uh, is deemed to be in the public interest as a matter of statute. So right now Mexico is an FTA country because of NAFTA, so exports to Mexico are deemed by statute to be in the public interest. It's very straightforward. Uh, so those could not be stopped uh, if the U.S were to withdraw from NAFTA, Mexico would no longer be an FTA country, but Mexico could still get gas under a more time-consuming process. Uh, I will say that because of some studies that have been generated, um, this used to be a very slow process. It would move much faster now. Uh, assuming that the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement is adopted, Mexico would remain an FTA country Exports to Mexico would be deemed by statute to be in the public interest, and it would be very hard for Trump to cut that off. Um, we hear a lot of talk recently about um, <clears throat> President Trump declaring a national emergency. He's talked about that for his uh, wall. Um, there is something called the International Economic Emergency Powers Act which gives the president extraordinary powers, and that would allow him to deal with contracts, to stop contracts for the sale of natural gas, where a U.S. resource, natural gas, would go to foreigners. However, he would have to declare a national emergency. He must consult with Congress. He must explain why there is an emergency and explain the proposed actions. And Congress would resist 
Um, this particular act builds upon the National, uh, Emer the, the National Emergencies Act, which allows the Congress to uh, send a resolution of disapproval. And that's very much on the agenda now. Uh, more practically, if President Trump declared an emergency having to do with um, a political issue, the, the border being dangerous or whatever, uh, Republicans are very fearful of that because they're fearful that a Democrat would then declare that um, global warming or um, guns present a national emergency. So this is a highly unlikely situation. And finally, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, of which the U.S. is a member, uh, it forbids prohibitions or restrictions on exports other than duties, taxes, or other charges. The U.S. and Mexico are parties. So Article 11 prohibits this. Um, there are exceptions for environmental and resource conservation reasons, but the exceptions cannot be, quote, applied in a manner which would constitute a means of arbitrary or uh, unjustifiable discrimination between countries where the same conditions prevail or disguise restrictions. Um, this would prevent Trump from um, simply cutting off exports uh, to benefit the U.S. or to apply politi political pressure to Mexico. Uh, there is an exception for national security, but that's not on point here. Importantly, the U.S. has su su uh, excuse me, successfully enforced this against China. Its own arguments would apply to forbid export restrictions on natural gas. Some strategies going forward. Um, Mexico has enormous prospective natural gas resources. Among the largest in the world, Mexico should continue its analytical work so it is ready to take advantage of those resources. And I just want to highlight here if you look at the um, conventional natural gas in the uh, deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico, these are huge. This is trillion cubic feet. And then if you look at for non-conventional in the Burgos Basin and the, the Sabinas Burro Picachos, huge, huge numbers. So we have 76 trillion cubic feet of prospective resources, and these are different than reserves. This is um, anticipated, but not uh, even in the air, in the category of reserves, uh, even possible. But uh, further work is needed on this. And look at these large numbers in the um, um, in the conventional and non-conventional strategies going forward on on production. Um, Veronica has already talked about these of the different levels. This um, a CNH plan talks about how to, to get to these uh, high production scenarios. First of all, more drilling. They propose a separate natural gas only company because natural gas is less profitable than oil and Pemex has uh, uh, tilted towards oil because it's more profitable. So the suggestion is for a natural gas only company, changing the tax regime and providing uh, incentives. The tax regime now is um, leans against increased uh, incentives. There is a need to pursue non-conventional plays if you want to get to the higher levels, but that involves fracking and uh, Veronica is going to talk about that. And there is a need for natural gas industry infrastructure, processing plants, storage, and more services. Uh, storage is a big issue. There was a, a major study done in um, March of 2018. Uh, included that Mexico needs strategic reserves to provide a cushion if for any reason the U.S. cuts off natural gas exports. So the policy from this study um, indicates that Mexico should build a strategic inventory of natural gas of 45 billion cubic feet, about five days of natural demand estimated for the year 2029. A bid process is set to go forward and was set to go forward in 2018 for the first 10 billion cubic feet, and that's now underway. 
Whether that will continue uh, also remains to be seen. And one can discuss whether five days are enough. It's, it's not, uh, but this is a place that they decided to start. And then clean energy. Um, this is important because clean energy reduces demand for natural gas. The Prodescend 2018 inclu includes a robust clean energy strategy if that's put in place. It will reduce the demand for natural gas. And I, I find these numbers very interesting. According to the Protocent 2018, 66% of new generation in place by 2032, that's new generation, will be from clean energy sources. So the prior administration had been focusing on much new clean energy generation, um, not only to meet the um, greenhouse gas objectives it set for itself, but to reduce the demand for uh, natural gas. Will President um, Lopez Obrador be supportive? We do, we do not know. So um, Veronica will now um, comment on um, what I presented to this point and also speak to the political environment and what we can see going forward. Veronica? Thank you. First of all, I want to say that John did an amazing job with these two papers, and I highly recommend them for all of you to read. And uh, I'm going to talk now about the political environment here in Mexico, and I have to say that there's still many questions out there that we don't have clarity about what the plan is. But uh, so far, President López Obrador has said that he wants to strengthen Pemex and reduce foreign participation. But we have to notice that the easy accessible hydrocarbons are coming to an end, and there's now more complex plays there, and we don't know if Pemex will be able to assume all these risks associated or how are they planning to share these risks with others. Um, the rondas have been suspended, as you know, and we are going to talk about this later as well. But uh, on the other hand, we see an increase in natural gas demand. Like Lopez Obrador's Proyecto de Nación document has some objectives that go towards that direction, including, uh, and let me go back just for a second, but the main driver of natural gas demand in Mexico has been the electricity sector by far. And in this new Proyecto de Nación, we see that they want to extend pipelines to regions that don't have access yet. And I think that's a really good idea because many areas of Mexico don't have natural gas and that, of course, doesn't allow the development of many industries there. And also for the residential sector, we still use mainly uh, LPG. So this is a good policy, but it will increase demand for natural gas. The second point is the conversion of conventional plants to combined cycles, about 4,000 megawatts, and to adapt all the other thermal plants to dual fuels. So the only disincentive that I see there for natural gas uh, demand growth is the increase in hydroelectricity, and he has repeatedly said that they want to develop more of the hydro, but that is only 800 megawatts, so it's not a lot. We will still need many more uh, power plants to sustain the growing demand in electricity. Here in this chart, I try to compare the prospectiva scenarios with uh, a scenario from López Obrador National Hydrocarbons Production Plan. And here I also want to mention that there's not, I haven't seen a document with the actual plans. It was just a, a presentation that doesn't have a lot of details. But from that presentation, we took those numbers that you see there on the red line. So as you can see, it's a very optimistic scenario that is much higher than what Cener had before, even under the high scenario from the prospectivas. 
And uh, I want to say that even under this optimistic scenario presented in López Obrador's plan, Mexico would still need important amounts of gas from the U.S. So I think that it makes a lot of sense to integrate Mexico into the rest of North America because it's the only real, efficient and liquid market in the world. And we have to keep that in mind. Um, so uh, the North American model implies real open access to pipelines, separating the services like the molecule and the transportation, and developing a secondary capacity market that would help to develop a futures market. And for me, it would be fantastic if we could move gas as easily to Veracruz than to any state in the US. So just to integrate Mexico to the US market. Because that model has proven to be the best in stimulating investment and new technology. But again, this market has allowed the development of shale gas. And it's not just a a matter of having the shale resources. It's a matter of having all the regulatory setup to allow the development of this technology. In Mexico now, for if you are not too familiar with our regulatory model, we have a hybrid model that is really strange and probably unique in the world we, because we have like a European-like regulation for the Senagas or Cistrangas. And we also have like a US model for the rest of the pipeline. So it's a very strange mix. And uh, going back to the presentation, I want to show you, and I have to add the source for these numbers because these numbers came from CRE. And uh, so we see here the difference between the what is the needed calculated before in terms of the investments and the budget for Pemex. So if you can see here, like for exploration and production, the budget is just half of what is needed. For pipeline sieves, it's like 20 times less of what is needed. And same for storage. So I think it's really important to as we move along with this new administration to have a more clear picture of how are they planning to move to a new strategy while making sure that we have all the natural gas and electricity that we need in Mexico. Um, President López Obrador has also indicated that he's opposed to fracking. So this would mean that fracking is off the table and that would affect production as uh, John was showing a lot of the prospective resources are in would require fracking and uh, so it would be really hard to increase production without fracking. I also mentioned before that the round 3.3 which was for non-conventional has been suspended and also the fourth long-term auction for clean energy has been cancelled recently. So that auction was for about uh, 2.6 gigawatts of renewable or clean energy uh, to start in 2021. So if we would replace that with a combined cycle, that would mean 59 more BCFs of natural gas demand. This uh, also shows what John was describing before in his chart, that most of the prospective resources are in non-conventional fields. And uh, well, my conclusion is that, you know, Mexico has a very extensive gas system and it has been used to displace uh, coal and uh, fuel oil, increasing, of course, natural gas demand. But yet, uh, Mexico's gas industry is a work in progress, and we need the investment and technology driving the competitive gas industry in the rest of North America. We have seen the results with really low prices, like in the US, people pay much less for gas than in Europe and Asia. 
So Mexico, I think, has to embrace a market like that and use its domestic resources more effectively. Uh, so basically, that's my conclusion. I also wanted to mention something about the pipeline capacity that John was describing. If all the pipelines that are in construction are built, then Mexico will have a considerable uh, excess capacity. And that is kind of a, one of the results of the regulation that I was mentioning, that there will probably be too much capacity. Now, all these, most of these pipelines that are under construction have been delayed. There's a lot of problems with the like, uh, social and environmental permits. So I think all of them have considerable delays, and that is a problem for, for Mexico. So uh, that's all I have to say for now. I don't know, John, if you want to add anything, or if Jeremy wants to say something. No, John, this is so ahead if you like. Um, I, I simply want to say we've moved through an enormous amount of material uh, very quickly. Um, you do have our me emails on these last slides. Um, both our emails are pretty easy to remember. Uh, John.McNeese at gmail.com and Veronica.Iristorza at Nira.com. Uh, if you have questions, please do feel free to contact us. Um, we necessarily had to compress huge amounts of information. I do uh, commend to you the papers I did, which you can uh, obtain through the Institute of the Americas website. So um, we do have some time. We do, hey John. Not don't don't uh, don't get a couple of minutes. So obviously people can feel free to email you as well. But um, I also don't want folks to, uh, to to jump offline just yet. Well, let me thank you both, John and Veronica, for your. Your usual, usual uh, very crisp and clear insights. Like you said, you did go through a lot of material, but a lot of uh, keen uh, insights there. So folks, don't don't hesitate to jump in. Let me ask Veronica something because I think there's an interesting piece here when we start looking at how much uh, of this natural gas growth in New Mexico. I mean, we all understand that it's been driven largely by the, the shift and the transition in the power market. And then you mentioned something about the hydro question, obviously the cancellation of the clean energy auction. What is, where, where are we in, in terms of Mexico's average uh, electric demand growth um, at this point? So I can understand where that cancellation of 2.6 gigawatts and 800 megawatts of hydro, what's the average demand growth for power? Well, I think, I mean, at this point we, we don't have a lot of clarity. I think the Mexican system does need the capacity for the future. The, the reserve margin is pretty low. So we need to move forward and build more capacity. And Mexico has commitments like both national and international on clean energy. So I think that the new administration is going to come up with a new alternative for these auctions. We just don't know what that is yet. And uh, the head of CFE announced yesterday that he was going to present a plan for electricity next week. So we'll have to wait and see what, what they decide. Okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's as we've learned, uh, it's, it, even with the long political transition in Mexico, where folks, we, we all knew who the new authorities were going to be, it seems like there's still a, a lot of uncertainty in the first uh, couple months of the administration. So um, thanks for flagging that. We'll keep our eyes open for that presentation. So here's a question. Um, you guys hopefully can see it there. I'll summarize it briefly. And essentially, I think what, uh, what Alejandro is, is asking, if fracking, if production from unconventional resources in Mexico, largely from, uh, from Burgos and Salinas basins, are, are brought forward. Um, will that, what, what will that pose in terms of uh, competition or impacts on the, the, the capacity for pipeline and exports from the U.S. and Mexico that you just spent the majority of the time discussing? I don't know if John, you want to take that first, and Veronica can, can chime in as well. Well, um, there has been a huge um, 
construction boom in pipelines in Mexico, not just the cross-border pipelines, but the pipelines within Mexico. And so this has been um, a major undertaking by, by Senegas. Um, and so the point of the, the Mexican development program was to get gas to where it's needed. Um, how that program is coming along, uh, a lot of it has been built, but, but pieces of it are still um, stopped. I, I know that TransCanada has recently stopped uh, a couple of the projects that it was working on. Um, I think between Tuxpan and Tula uh, because of, of problems, because of what they view as extortion. So whether it's actually going to be built and under what timetable, um, I'm not sure. Veronica, do you want to speak to the issues with um, how that domestic pipeline construction project is coming along? No, I don't know the details of the, there's not, a lot of public information about the delays, so I don't have a, a lot of details for that. But that, what I want to see is what I mentioned before. I think there will be excess capacity for pipelines in Mexico. So part of the question said if there was going to be something in parallel, but I would I would think that it would make more sense to have uh, smaller pipelines going from all these huge pipelines that are under construction. And I also wanted to mention something that I forgot. I think shale gas is not just a matter of political will. There are conditions that are very specific to the US and we haven't seen those developing in other countries. So uh, those, like the main issues are land ownership. Like in Mexico, remember we have the Napoleon's law. So the land is not owned by the farmers. And I think that's a big challenge to overcome. Um, that you know is different in the US. The second point is access to pipelines that I mentioned before. I think that Mexican regulation should move towards the US regulation so that there's a real market and anyone can just dump their <laughs> gas in the pipelines. And the third point is the services companies that are there in the US and I've heard stories that they are faster to get anywhere than a cable company. So those three points are important, I think, and for those reasons, I think it's going to take some time for Mexico to, to develop its shale resources, even if there is political will to do so. Well, thank you. Uh, I will say, however, benchmarking against uh, service of cable providers may be not so uh, good, but no, joking aside, Veronica, you, you make some, some, some keen points about we, we sort of focus on the political element, uh, you know, what the president of Mexico has said vis-a-vis -vis fracking, what his secretary of energy said recently. But you make a key point, which is a much more economic feasibility discussion. And, and I would just throw into that, I remember a couple of years ago, we did a webinar specifically on the unconventional potential of Mexico. And at that point in time, and I don't think it changed, but at least not materially, the key issue uh, or key impediment for really tapping the unconventional potential of Mexico was the security question. And, you know, I, I think that remains, as we've seen with the Huachicoleo situation, um, just how fraught the, the situation is and how that could have a significant impact uh, and has already had a significant impact on, on large scale infrastructure, particularly pipeline development. And then and therefore also, like you know, in terms of the overall feasibility of, of, of fracking and conventional production. Um, we have some, some other questions here. Let me, um, let me try. So, so John, quickly, I think you, you laid out a little bit. If you could just quickly give your opinion, I think the emphasis uh, on your opinion, uh, well, the all caps from Alan there, um, on uh, risk to Mexico for dependence on U.S. gas. Give us, give us a couple sentences summary of that. Yeah. Uh, my view, when you take into account the full mix of availability risk, pricing risk, and dependency political risk, um, is that Mexico could could reasonably determine that the risks are acceptable. Uh, however, this all depends on um, projections, and um, projections are by their very nature 
uncertain. Yeah. One cannot know the future. And so I think Mexico does have to have a mitigation strategy in place. And that's why they should be uh, prepared to um, particularly take advantage of um, studies. It depends on how much Mexico wants to spend. Um, you know, if they want to do a, a huge production uh, initiative, they will either have to um, get huge new uh, investment into Pemex plus acquire more technology um, or, or else uh, joint venture with foreigners for the resources, the technology and the risk sharing. But uh, the, the joint ventures, which are permitted by the uh, Mexican energy reform, is, is still politically problematic. So, so whether or not, uh, how, how far Mexico wants to go um, is, is unclear. So my view is that the risks are, uh, it would be reasonable for Mexico to accept those risks of political dependency. You know, one can argue that uh, Mexico can take advantage of the low prices of natural gas, let the U.S. accept the environmental degradation associated with fracking, um, and with this low-cost natural gas meet its own needs and make money on, on oil. Um, I know that that's not necessarily politically acceptable, but that's one approach. Uh, or the other thing is, is that uh, with the these risks, it's certainly reasonable for Mexico to rely on imports in a transition phase where it does move towards more self-sufficiency. So that's um, those are my thoughts. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so uh, we've got time. We'll get these last two questions. Thank you, Alejandro and Christopher. So uh, interesting question from Alejandro on sort of a global uh, price and supply uh, question. Does the, or do you all see any impact in price or, or availability for gas moving to Mexico from the U.S. Uh, as mega projects uh, for U.S. LNG exports come online? For example, the, uh, the Exxon project is being passed. But as, as you noted, John, in your papers there, and, and there's a host of projects on the drawing board um, various stages of development to export U.S. gas via liquefied natural gas. So where, where do those fit into the, um, the price scenario for Mexico? I think is the main point here. And, and both of you feel free to chime in, please. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, the, the nearest study is precisely to deal with this question. As you have projects come online, what's it going to do to price? And the NIRA study says that as there is more demand for natural gas from U.S. production, and there would be more demand if more is being exported uh, uh, overseas via LNG, um, the NIRA study says that if production responds to market forces, 80% um, of the demand will be met by, by new production. So there is an upward pressure on prices, but if production continues at the rate it has been in response to market, market forces, the increase in price should not be that much. Now, uh, um, as each project comes online, we're going to have a real life testing of these projections. So, you know, as the uh, Exxon uh, Cutter uh, Eckwork project at the Sabine Pass comes online, and we will start to see what prices uh, start to, to do in response. And so that won't be an instantaneous thing. So there will be uh, effect in prices over um, you know, a few year period, and that timetable will give Mexico some scope to change its strategy. Prices start to move up faster than expected. Would you reference the NIRA study? So, Veronica, over to you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, besides the NIRA study that John already mentioned, and this was done a few months ago, I was thinking of the annual energy outlook 
of 2019 and that is publicly available but it's really interesting that even considering huge LNG exports they forecast the price to remain pretty low so I think that's a that also goes to the same direction that John was mentioning but the what is also surprising is that probably gas production from shells is moving even faster than it was forecasted a few years ago. So I think it's really interesting and really exciting what is happening in the U.S. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the, the continued growth and the excess capacity um, to be absorbed and put into the international market and then the demand for it um, in the international market seems to still be there. So um, thank you. I, and I'll, I'll make a shameless plug here uh, for a, a paper we just published at the end of January Last year, we had some graduate students here at UCSD do some research on the role of the Panama Canal for LNG, and we just put out last Friday um, a whole analysis and discussion of the feasibility of another expansion. So obviously, those folks know about three years ago, the Panama Canal had a major expansion to accommodate larger ships, and part of that has been successfully capturing and allowing larger scale LNG tankers through, and with the increase in U.S. exports, you know, obviously from the Gulf Coast, East Coast, the role of the Panama Canal and another expansion is just weighing into the global LNG market uh, analysis. So uh, look for that uh, paper on our website. And let me get to Christopher's final question, or not his final question, our final question from Christopher Lenton. Um, it says, Veronica, you mentioned it would be fantastic if Mexico could, could develop a market similar to the U.S. with open access to capacity, secondary, and future markets. Uh, where do you see the potential for this under the current administration, the new administration in Mexico? I think it's possible because Mexico has already been moving in that direction and if you see the latest Sena gas rates for example they are more going to this direction of having like a clear cost-based incremental tariff so I'm hopeful and I think that it is likely that we can move there. Wonderful. Well, let me, uh, for those of you who have been to, to the Americas events and our webinars and panels and, of course, the La Jolla Conference, which is another opportunity to meet a plug our in Mexico at the end of the month in Argentina and the La Jolla Conference, I always love to end the discussions and panels with a yes or no question for the, uh, the panelists. So here's a very easy one for John and Veronica. Will fracking occur under the Lopez Obrador administration in Mexico? Yes or no? That is a very hard question, Jeremy. That's a yes or no. Come on, those are easy. <laughs> um, I, I will punt. I will say I don't know. <laughs> Option C. All right, Veronica, over to you. Yes, me too. <laughs> yes, as in it will occur or no, you, you no, will. No, yes, I'm yes. asking. I agree with John. <laughs> I not pin either one of you down. That's okay. Well, look, I want to thank John McNeese and Veronica Dastorsa for a wonderful uh, presentation today. And, and again, be sure to, to look, and we'll send out links to John's papers uh, that he published last year. They are they're must read and, and uh, really have a better understanding. And he presented a lot of the information today, but be sure to look into, into the report and get a little bit more detail. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure and uh, delighted to have everyone out there with us today as part of our webinar series. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll be announcing more webinars in the near future, but meanwhile, we look forward to organ organizing our roundtable conferences. We hope to see you there. Thanks to Jacqueline Sanchez, who's always uh, working hard behind the, behind the curtain there on our webinar series and making sure that uh, the audio and uh, everything comes off smoothly. Thanks, Jackie. Follow us on social media. Best way to keep up with us. Have a wonderful day. Have a great afternoon, great morning, wherever you are. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy.